Hello Year 5 and 6. Today's lesson, Friday the 22nd of May, can I interpret and explain information using evidence from the text? So in today's lesson, I'm going to read Chapter 9 in a moment, The Night of the Turtles. So again, before reading, I want you to think and understand the following vocabulary. So we've got reproach, cocoon, reconciliation, trepidation, expounding and haunch. These words appear in the chapter but before I read it I would like you to have an understanding of what those words mean. So if you'd like to pause the video now and look those up. Okay so I'm going to read chapter 9 after reading, I want you to think about the following things and write down. Okay, so why do you think Kansuki has changed his mind about leaving the island? Find at least three pieces of evidence from the chapter. Okay, so as you're reading, think about, as you're listening, think about why Kansuki has changed his mind and looking for those three pieces of evidence and then record them down on paper. Okay. So I'm going to read chapter 9. Chapter 9, The Night of the Turtles. There fell between us a long and aching silence. Kansuki never once reproached me for what I had done. He was not angry or sullen at me, but I knew I had hurt him to the soul. It wasn't that we didn't speak. We did, but we no longer talked to one another as we had before. We lived, each of us, in our separate cocoons, quite civil, always polite, but not together anymore. He had closed in on himself and wrapped himself in his thoughts. The warmth had gone from his eyes, the laughter in the cave house was silenced. He never said so, he did not need to, but I knew that now he would prefer to paint alone, to fish alone, to be alone. So day after day I wandered the island with Stella, hoping when I returned that he might have forgiven me, that we could be friends again, but always he kept that distance between us. I grieved, grieved for my lost friendship. I remember I went often now to the other end of the island, to Watch Hill, and sat there, and sat there, no longer looking out for ships, but rehearsing aloud my explanation. But no matter how much I rehearsed it, how I reasoned it, I could never convince even myself that what I had done was anything other than treachery. In the end, as it turned out, it was Kansuki who explained it to me. We had just gone to bed one night when Tomodachi came to the mouth of the cave and squatted there. She had done this once or twice lately, stayed for just a few minutes, peered in at us and gone off again. Kansuki spoke up in the darkness. She lose... King Cambo again, he said. She always lose her baby, King Cambo. Very wicked baby. He run off a lot. He make Tamadachi very sad mother. He clapped his hands at her, shooing her away. King Cambo not here, Tamadachi. Not here. But Tamadachi stayed. I think for comfort more than anything else. I had, not I had noticed before with the orangutans how they would often come to Kansuki when they were upset or frightened just to be near him. After a while, Tamadachi slunk off into the night and left us alone again, with the din of the forest and the silence between us. I think many thoughts, Kansuki said suddenly, out of the silence. You are sleeping, Miss, Miss Kassan. He had not called me by my name for weeks, ever since the Coke bottle incident. No, I said. Very good. I got a lot to say. You listen, I talk. I think many th thoughts. When I think of Tamadachi, I think of your mother. Your mother, she too loose her baby. She loose you. That very sad thing for her. Maybe she come looking and she not find you. You not there when she come. She think you dead forever. But she see you in her mind. Now I speak, maybe she see you in her mind. You always there, I know. I have son too. I have Mikaya. He always in my head, like Kimmy. They dead for sure. But they in my head, they in my head forever. For a long while he did not say another word. I thought he had gone to sleep, then he spoke again. I tell you everything, I think. Miss Gassan, 
It's best way. I stay on this island because I want to stay on this island. I do not want to go home Japan. Different thing for you. You want to go back home across the sea and that right thing. Good thing, good thing for you, but not good for me. For me, very sad thing. Many years I live alone here. I happy here. Then you come. I hate you when you first come, but after a little while, you are like son to me. I think maybe I like father to you. You like son to me. I very sad now when you go. I like talk with you. I like listen. I like sound when you speak. I want you to stay here on the island. You understand? I think so, I said. But you do one very bad thing. We friends. But you not tell me what you feel. You not say what you do. That not honourable thing to do. When I find bottle, when I read words, I very sad person indeed. But after a little while, I understand. I think maybe you want to stay here with me and you want to also go home. So when you find bottle, you write message. You do not say what you do because you know it make me sad. I write, yes. Yes, I said. You very young person, Miss Kassan. You paint good picture, very good picture. Like Huku Sai. <coughs> you have long life waiting for you. You cannot live whole life on this island with old man who die one day. So thinking like this, I changed my mind. You know what we do tomorrow? He didn't wait for me to answer. We start build new fire, big fire. We ready then for when we see ship. Then you go home. And also we do another thing. We play football. You, me. What you say? All right, it was all I could say. He had in just those few moments lifted the whole weight of guilt off my shoulders and given me such happiness, such new hope. Very good, very good. You sleep now. We do lot of work tomorrow, lot of football also. The next morning we began building a beacon on the hilltop above the cave house. We used most of the pile of firewood we had collected for the cooking fire and stored in the dry of the back of the cave. He even sacrificed some of his best pieces of driftwood. It wasn't far to carry it. So before long we had enough to make a sizeable fire. Kansuki said it would do for the moment that we could find more from the forest, more and more each day as we wanted. We soon have fire so big they see in Japan maybe, he laughed. We have lunch now, then sleep, then football, yes? Later that afternoon we set up sticks in the sand for a goal and took turns at shooting at each other. The ball was very soft and so it didn't bounce any better. On the sand, then it had back on the mud of the recreation ground back home. But it didn't matter. Kintsuki may have carried a stick, he may have been as old as the hills, but he could kick a football well enough to put it past me, and often too. What a time we had. Neither of us wanted it to end. With a crowd of bemused orangutans looking on, with Stella interfering and chasing after every goal scored, we were at it till darkness drove us at last back up the hill. We were both too tired to do more than have a long drink of water, eat a banana or two and go to our sleeping mats. It was after our reconciliation that I came to know Kintsuki better than I ever had before. His English became more and more fluent and he clearly loved to speak it now. For some reason he was always more happy to talk while we were out fishing in his outrigger. We did not go out that often, only when the fishing was so poor in the shallows that we needed to catch big fish for smoking and keeping. Once at sea, the story simply flowed. He talked a great deal of his childhood in Japan, of his twin sister and how the worst thing he'd ever done was to push her out of the tree in their garden, how she'd broken her arm, how, when he painted that cherry tree, it always reminded him of her. But she too had been in Nag Nagasaki when the bomb fell. I remember he even told me the address of where he lived when he was studying in London. Number 22, Claren Card Gardens. I never, I've never forgotten it. Once he had gone to watch Chelsea playing football and afterwards he'd sat astride a lion in Trafalgar Square and been kicked off by a policeman. But it was Kimmy and Michaya he talked of most about how he wished he could have seen Michaya grow up. Michaya, he said, would have been nearly 50 by now if the bomb hadn't fallen on Nagasaki and Kimmy would it be exactly the same age as he was 75. I rarely interrupted when he was like this but once to comfort him I did say bombs don't kill everyone they could still be alive you never know you could find out you could go home he looked at me then as if 
It was the first time such a possibility had ever occurred to him in all those years. Why not, I went on. When we see a ship and we light the fire and they come and fetch me, you could come too. You could go back to Japan. You don't have to stay here. He thought about it for some time, but then shook his head. No, he said, they are dead. That bomb was a very big bomb, very terrible bomb. Americans say Nagasaki is destroyed, every house. I hear them, my family dead for sure. I stay here, I safe here, I stay on my island. Day after day, we piled more and more wood on the beacon. It was massive now, bigger even than the one I had built, I had built on Watch Hill. Every morning now, before we went down to the pool to wash, Kansuki would send me up to the top of the hill with his binoculars. I always scanned the horizon, both in hope and in trepidation. I longed to see a ship, of course, I did. I longed to go home, but at the same time, I dreaded what that would mean. I felt so much at home with Kansuki. The thought of leaving him filled me with a terrible sadness. I determined to do all I could to persuade him to come away with me, if and when a ship came. At every opportunity now, I talked to him of the outside world, and the more I talked, the more he seemed to become interested. Of course, I never spoke of the wars and famines and disasters. I painted the best picture of the world outside I could. There was so much he didn't know. He marvelled at all I told him, at the microwave in our kitchen, at the computers and what they could do, at Concord flying faster than the speed of sound, at men going to the moon and satellites. These things took some explaining, I can tell you. Some of it he didn't even believe, not at first. The time came when he began to quiz me. In particular, he would ask about Japan. But I knew very little about Japan, only that back home in England, lots of things, including our microwave, had made in Japan written on them. Cars, calculators, my father's stereo, my mother's hairdryer. I made in Japan person, he laughed. Very old machine, still good, still very strong. Try as I did to draw my memory after a while, I could find nothing more to tell him about Japan. But he would still keep asking, you sure there's no war in Japan these days? I was fairly certain there wasn't and said so. They built up Nagasaki again after bomb. I told him they had and hoped I was right. All I could do was to reassure him as best as I could and then tell him the same few things I did know about over and over again. He seemed to love to hear it, like a child listening to a fav to a favourite fairy story. Once, after I'd finished ex expounding yet again on the amazing sound quality of my father's brilliant Sony stereo that made the whole house vibrate, he said very quietly, maybe one day, day before I die, I go back to my home. One day, I go back to Japan, maybe. I wasn't sure he meant it, but he did mean that he was at least considering it, and that gave me some cause for hope. It wasn't until the night of the turtles, though, that I came to believe Kansuki was really serious about it. I was fast asleep when he woke me. You come, Mikasan. Very quickly, you come, you come, he said. What for, I asked him. But he was already gone. I ran out after him into the moonlight and caught him up halfway down the track. What are we doing? Where are we going? Is it a boat? Very soon, you see, very soon. Stella had stayed at my heels all the way to the beach. She never liked going out in the dark very much. I looked around. There was nothing there. The beach looked completely deserted. The waves lapped list listlessly. The moon rode the clouds and the world felt still about me, as if it was holding its breath. I did not see what was happening until Kansuki suddenly fell on his knees in the sand. They're very small. Sometimes they are not so strong. Sometimes in the morning, birds come and eat them. And then I saw it. I thought it was a crab at first. It wasn't. It was a minuscule turtle, tinier than a terrapin, clambering out of a hole in the sand and then beetling off down, down the beach towards the sea. Then another and another, and further down the bench, dozens of them, hundreds, I could see now, maybe thousands, all scuttling across the moonlit sand into the sea. Everywhere, the beach was alive with them. Stella was no nosing at one, so I warned her off. She yawned and looked up innocently at the moon. I saw that one of them was on its back at the bottom of the hole, legs kicking frantically. Kansuki reached down, picked it up gently and set it on its feet in the sand. You go to the sea, little turtle, he said. You live there now. You soon be big, fine turtle. And then one day you come back and see me, maybe. He sat back on his haunches to watch him scuttle off. You know what they do, Micah? Mother turtles, they lay eggs in this place. Then one night time, every year, always when the moon is high, little turtles are born. 
Long way to go to the sea, very many die. So I always stay. I help them. I chase birds away so they not eat baby turtles. Many years from now, when turtles are big, they come back, they lay eggs again. True story, Mikasan. All night long, we kept our vigil over the mass birth as the infant turtles made their run for it. We patrolled together, reaching into every hole we found to see if there were any left, stuck or stranded. We found several too weak to make the journey and carried them down into the sea ourselves. The sea seemed to revive them. Anyway, they went. No swimming lessons needed. We turned dozens the right way up and shepherded them safely into the sea. When dawn came and the birds came down to scavenge, scavenge we were there to drive them off stella chased and barked after them and we ran at them shrieking waving hurling stones we were not entirely successful but most of the turtles made it down into the sea but even here they were still not entirely safe in spite of all our desperate efforts a few were plucked up out of the water by the birds and carried off by noon it was all over kansuki was tired as we stood ankle deep in the water watching the very last of them swim away we put his arm on my shoulder they very small turtles, Mikasan, but they very brave. They braver than me. They do not know what they find out here. What happened to them? But they go anyway. Very brave. Maybe they teach me good lesson. I make up my mind. When one day ship come and we light fire and they find us, then I go. Like turtles, I go. I go with you. I go home to Japan. Maybe I find Kimi. Maybe I find Mikaya. I find truth. I go with you, Mikasan. Okay, year five and six. So now after hearing chapter nine, you should be able to answer why do you think Kinsuki has changed his mind about leaving the island and find three evidence, three pieces of evidence. Also, what I would like you to do, because today you will finish the novel. So when you have finished all the readings, all the chapters, I'd like you to have a go at this activity. So using evidence from the book, draw a map or make a model of the island and label and describe four important events from the story explain why you think it was important to the story so try and do at least a paragraph for each of the four events be as creative as you like and i've put here the actual map that is in the book for you to look at so you can make a model but four important events that happen in the story okay Goodbye for now, Year 5 and 6.